You know, plant friend, I got to tell you, I feel like rubber plants don't get enough credit in the tropical plant world, much like the snake plants that we talked about several episodes back. These humble rubber plants are always available at the garden center. They're always affordable, but they tend to get overlooked by some of our sexier Instagram-worthy plants, if you know what I mean. But they're fantastic plants for many reasons that we're going to dive into in today's episode. I myself have never taken the plunge to get a rubber plant, but after this conversation with Raphael from Ohio Tropics, I have moved them to the top of my wish list. So welcome to episode 148 of Blue Mango Radio. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks as per usual. I had some fun repotting plants today. I took a midday work break to repot a little Peperomia prostrata that I have, a beautiful anthurium that had gotten a little root bound. So I've, I've enjoyed taking some time in the middle of my work days to do fun plant-related topics as, as a way to take a break and rest my eyes from our screens. March is always a really fun month for us as well who live in the in the Northeast because this is the month where we start to feel this like gentle tickle of spring, if you know what I'm talking about. I'm totally ready to move out of winter and into the growing season, but I do have to say I've really enjoyed these last few winter months for us New Yorkers and really explored the concept of dormancy for myself, right? So allowing myself to go dormant metaphorically, I took a lot of lazy weekends where we made absolutely no plans, which is super unusual for me and Billy. We're usually hyper-scheduled, always seeing people, and we really got intentional with January and February to just rest and recuperate after the crazy couple of seasons that we've had with all of our moves and getting married and It was really nice to enjoy a bit of quiescence within myself. But after the third month of snow, definitely ready for some sunshine, definitely ready to start growing the plant collection again in the future. I'm excited to bring today's episode guest to you. Um, I can't believe it's taken this long to bring him on the show, but Raphael from Ohio Tropics, um, he is a huge fan of the humble rubber plant, gets a ton of questions about them from his followers because he has a large plant community over on his blog. So we are going to talk all things rubber plants. You know, although it's celebrated, as an easy care plant. Raphael and I were talking about the rubber plant and he said that he just gets so many questions. So this episode is kind of two parts. The first part is gonna be an overview of general rubber plant care, different types of rubber plants you should try, all sorts of stuff. And then the second half is actually frequently asked questions. So Raphael sent me frequently asked questions that he gets specifically about rubber plants. And then we talk about the answers to them and troubleshoot what might be going on in relation to those questions. Um, so we have this kind of living record of, of all the answers for our community and for Raphael's community, which is amazing. And after talking to him about all of the variegated versions, I'm like so stoked to bring one home, especially maybe one of the pink guys, but I will let Raphael tell you more about those. So without further ado, here is our interview on rubber plants. Raphael, welcome finally to Bloom and Grow Radio. Thank you so much. I love your podcast. I have been following you for a long time. I I kind of can't believe when you hopped on this call, I said, I kind of can't believe we've not had you on the show earlier and that you and I (laughs) haven't become plant friends earlier. I don't understand it. But Um, we are now. You can't get rid of me now. (laughs) Exactly. We are now. And I feel like we just shared the most intimate moment together when we hopped on our Zoom call. Your book had just arrived and I got to just share in your joy for a minute. That's amazing. Thank you so much. It literally came 15 minutes before we started talking. So I saw the boxes outside and I ran and got them. Oh my gosh, especially in the snow, right? Yes. <laughs> so exciting. We're both coming out with books this spring uh, season and uh, I can just so relate to just anxiously awaiting that moment. So congrats and can't wait to hear more about your book in a little bit. Thank you. But I'm so excited to chat with you today about a plant that I feel like is so underrated in the plant community, often overlooked, but really cool, the rubber plant. Absolutely. And, you know, I I always say that everybody wants to get the rare plants all the time. And like you said, rubber plants are kind of neglected. I feel like the variegated varieties are bringing them back, but Mm -hmm. I just have a plain old green rubber plant that I've had for years and that's reached my ceiling. 
And a lot of people grow them, but th- there's also a lot of struggles too that people have. Absolutely. And I, I can't wait. You have been kind enough to send me a list of your commonly asked questions. I can't wait to dive in, but you have all of these commonly asked questions because you are the man behind Ohio Tropics, a huge blog. So do you want to give our listeners a brief introduction to how you became the plant dad you are today? Yes. So it's an interesting story, actually, as all these, all these things are, I think. So one day about a little, almost, almost five years ago, I got a call from a friend that had moved from, uh, from the West Coast to the Northeast Ohio area. So I'm in, I'm in the Cleveland area. And she said, you need to start a blog. She said, <laughs> she said you have all this plant knowledge. And I, I was following this one lady back home on the West Coast, and she shared tips on when to do things, how to do things in your garden. And she said, you have all this knowledge, you have to share it. Why don't you start a blog? And I told her, I've always wanted to, but I, I just never got around to it. Mm-hmm. And the way I operate is when, when something clicks and I get excited about it, I go full force, I take off. And the next day I started my blog. <laughs> so I started on Ohio Tropics, ohiotropics.com. And initially the blog was focused on gardening with a tropical flair in cold weather climates. And so I, I initially started, started that way. And, and I also talked about orchids a lot, but it segued into houseplants. And right now, you know, and that, that continues to be the, the, the majority of my, t- of my content um, is focused on houseplant care. So that was almost five years ago that I started it. You have the jungliest Zoom background, an enormous (laughs) Pachira Aquatica, numerous. I will describe it for listeners. You're sitting in this beautiful room in what is obviously a very snowy location, but you have a huge Pachira Aquatica, big monsteras, all sorts of moss poles, all sorts of dangling plants. (laughs) Philodendron Brazil, it looks like back there. Some really lush trailing plants. Um, Yes. Yeah. And that's interesting. I like the, you know, Ohio, you obviously think of being like the coldest place in the United States. So it's fun that you have, you focused on tropics and create that. I think we've all related to, if we live in some place that's cold, there's something so cool about looking at your window when it's snowing and having the outlines of your monstera or your house plants against that snowy backdrop. I think it's so cool. It's the best. It really is. It makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you're coming out with a new book, House Plant Warrior, which I'm yes. so excited to hear more about after we dive into the goods of the rubber plant. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, rubber plants, I said they're so underutilized, they're so underrated because here, here's what I think about rubber plants. And ironically, I don't have a rubber plant right now in my collection. So I'm oh my speaking gosh, so, you need one. I know I'm speaking so author- authoritatively about them, but I think that they're great. Number one, they're they can be hardy if you put them in the right setup. Number two, you can buy them in a four inch pot or you can, they can grow to be trees. Like so many people struggle wanting really big plants in their space and rubber plants are a great, great option. Also, they really come in so many beautiful variegated varieties, which is why, like you said, they're coming back into popularity. But I just, I feel like they're like an unsung hero of your, of your basic houseplant collection, you know? I totally agree with that. Absolutely. So I love diving more into plant Latin on Bloom and Grow Radio. We hear rubber plant is the common name. So do you want to break down what is a rubber plant? Sure. So Ficus elastica is is the botanical name. And actually, it's related to a lot of other houseplants that we grow and also some edible plants. So it actually, um, Ficus elastica belongs to the Moraceae plant family, which is commonly called uh, it's sometimes called the mulberry plant family, sometimes called the fig family. I call it the fig family. And it actually is related to the fig that we eat. I don't know if you like fresh figs. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I have one in my garden and it's unfortunately, I'm, I'm a huge procrastinator. It's buried in snow. I should have covered it. It will grow back from the roots. So I could have saved the canes if, if I covered it. But anyway, it's related to, to the edible fig. It's related to the mulberry tree, which has edible fruit. And talking about houseplants, so it's also related to, there's a lot of other ficus, the fiddle leaf fig, ficus lyrata, obviously, you know, that's a different species of of ficus. Um, And then also ficus, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, the ficus audrey, so ficus 
bengalensis, if I'm pronouncing that. Mm-hmm. So that's actually ficus audrey, and it's the strangler fig that uh, you know many of us may may have heard. Or banyan tree is is a common name for for that. So the interesting part about ficus elastica, the reason that the where the species name comes from, is because of the latex that oozes out. I, I know you said you don't have a uh, you don't have a rubber tree, but for anyone listening. If you've ever cut a branch mm-hmm. or, you know, snap the leaf off or anything like that, you see this white latex oozing out and dripping all over the place. It used to be used to make rubber. However, it was pretty inferior in quality. And so they eventually came up with, with another plant, Hevia brasiliensis, which is, the, which is the tree that we now get natural rubber from. Basically, that's in a nutshell, you know, that's that's the the origin. And for anyone listening, that latex is toxic, right? It is. Yeah, it's a skin irritant. So be careful if you, you know, wear gloves, if you're handling it, if you're handling, you know, if you're pruning your plant or doing something like that, or if you get it on your skin, go ahead and wash it off really quickly. It is also toxic to pets as well. So just be careful. Yeah, be careful around your puppies and your your kittens. We've had several episodes on plants and cats, and it's so it's so interesting hearing how people decorate and avoid, you know, pet damage to plants. Yep. Yep. So what about in nature? Where do these plants thrive in nature? So their native range is Nepal, China, and Malaysia, typically. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll see them growing if, if, I don't know how much you travel at all to warmer, warmer areas. We like to travel. Um, so they're native to South, Southeast Asia, but they can grow in, in any warm climate. Mm-hmm. I've seen, you know, beautiful specimens in Florida. Um, I was just actually in the Virgin Islands and saw them growing outside there in, in full sun. In Mexico, I've seen a lot of them growing, growing in Mexico. And they get huge. They get, you know, they're 100 foot tall trees yeah. in nature. They get really big. I recently just went on my honeymoon in Costa Rica and my husband kept making fun of me because I kept making him take selfies with these enormous rubber trees. And they had, you know, the other thing that's so cool about rubber plants, ficus elastica, so many of their new growth is pink. And so, so many of these different rubber trees I was seeing or rubber plants I was seeing just had the most gorgeous, like, you know, juvenile foliage and yeah, we have we have selfies all over Costa Rica with plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful. Some of the variegated varieties have mm-hmm. um, the pinkish newer leaves, and sometimes they fade. But they're beautiful. And, stems and the, too, yeah. And the sheaths that you know that cover the new leaves. Some of them are nice, bright red. They're beautiful. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Unsung once again. <laughs> so, let's talk about the different types of rubber rubber plants. I do feel like you've got your basic, you mentioned you have your basic green one that, you know, you see in the hardware stores and at most plant shops. So can you kind of walk us through all the different types of varieties? Yeah. And there's probably more than this. I can't keep up with all the, all the newer varieties coming up, but the ones I'm about to talk about or mention are, are the ones that you'll commonly see, Mm -hmm. you know, for the most part. So there's a couple, if if we want to put them in in two buckets, we have just the non-variegated rubber plants and then the variegated rubber plants. So the most commonly available non-variegated ones, Ficus elastica decora, and that used to be, I, I think that that was probably the most common variety before this huge plant craze lately. You know, the typical, typical green leaves. Uh, there's another variety or cultivar called Ficus elastica robusta, which is similar to the decora, but it has larger leaves. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think mine, the one that I have, I believe is a, a decora, just judging from the size of the leaves. Um, of course, it wasn't labeled, you know, they're not always labeled the best when you're purchasing yeah. them. <laughs> and sometimes as they're incorrect know. as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely. My favorite yeah. is, I think one time I saw uh, a label that's, that just said tropical green plant. I'm, yeah. Hey, that's, that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there's another variety, which I think is stunning. The last non-variegated variety. Like a Celastica burgundy, which has gorgeous, yes. gorgeous, super, super dark, mm-hmm. almost, almost black, not quite black, but, but approaching black. 
And I think those are beautiful as well. Oh my God. And that's the one that has those kind of burgundy stems. Like it yes. has that dark, it's so moody. It's such a vibe. It, it would be beautiful. such a, I feel like in a modern home, that's kind of minimalistic. That would be such a beautiful statement plant, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It has a red mid rib on the leaf. And then I think the sheets are also a vibrant, a nice vibrant red color as well. Yeah. Um, and then we have, as far as, you know, the two most popular variegated varieties, Ficus elastica tinnicky, if I'm pronouncing that right. Yes. Um, so that has different shades of green and yellow and cream. That's a beautiful one as well. And then there's Ficus elastica ruby, which has a beautiful pink variegation. And that's a gorgeous one. Those are probably the two most common variegated varieties. And there's another one called and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that. I've never heard this pronounced. The cultivar Ficus elastica docherii. Okay. We'll go, well, we'll go with you that. You get points for trying. There's no, no <laughs> judgment here with how you pronounce your plant Latin. <laughs> and that one, that one's similar to, to the, um, the tinnicky. I think the leaves are a little bit narrower, but you know, we, we call them what you want. The care for all of them is the same. Mm -hmm. There might be a couple, a couple little intricacies with with the variegated varieties however the the care for the most part is identical if you have the travel bug if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world i have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan friend it's called women who travel from conde nast traveler and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home join host lale arikaglu who has a particularly delightful voice and british accent each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist as well as the story Stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah, we had Chris Satch on the podcast years ago. It's a fantastic episode all about variegation. And it is interesting. I mean, variegated plants need more volume of light than a non-variegated plant, but it's such an interesting deep dive into variegation and, and why it's so interesting hot right now. Yeah. I will say pink plants are so hot. So that, that oh, last yeah. one, I've seen the Ruby one, like all over the place. Yeah. That's a beautiful one. Yeah. And those variegated types, the, the patterns on their leaves are just so beautiful. It's almost unbelievable to see. Yeah. And you never know what you'll get. I mean, that's part of the beauty of variegated plants. You never know, you know, what the next leaf is going to look like. Um, the only, uh, it, it does test people's patience though, because they don't, they won't grow as quickly as, you know, their non-variegated counterparts. Yeah. And, you know, there, there, there might be some frustrations with, you know, if, if you get a leaf that's not as pink as you want it, or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the way that you, the way that you expect it. Yeah, totally. So you mentioned general care pretty much for all of these plants, we can take one generalized approach, obviously with a few exceptions. So why don't we go over general basic rubber plant care? Do we want to start with water? Sure. We can start with watering. So watering. So I, I have actually have a funny, not a funny story, kind of a, kind of a sad story. And I don't know what your thoughts are about moisture meters. I'm not a proponent of moisture meters. I'm not saying don't use one. You just have to be careful. And I, I had a friend reach out to me and she said, oh, my rubber plant's suffering and it looks really bad. Can you help me with it? I said, sure. And anytime anyone reaches out to me, I always tell them, please send me a picture. Yeah. Please send me a picture. And I can, I can tell oftentimes from the picture what's going on. She told me she uses, I asked, well, how do you water? She said, well, I, I, I use a moisture meter and it's indicating that it's fine and that the, the, the potting mix is so moist. And I said, okay. And I said, when was the last time you watered? And she said, it was a few months ago. Mm. And I said, 
oh, <laughs> and I'm I'm not saying I'm not saying every single moisture meter is faulty, but there are so many junky ones. And my my best recommendation, I, I know this is I'm segueing into different topics, but they're all related. When we're talking about watering, your finger is seriously your best friend. Touch your potting mix. It needs to dry out sufficiently. Always, always water thoroughly. Always have a drainage hole. And I use my finger to determine how dry, you know, the potting mix has gotten. So if you have a small pot, let's say a four inch pot, I would maybe let the top half inch or so to dry out before watering it again thoroughly. If you have a much bigger pot, so the, my, my rubber plant that is probably nine feet tall right now, it's in, it's in a big 15 inch. Um, yeah, the, the diameter of the pot is about 15 inches. And for that size pot, you can wait for it, you know, a lot more of it to dry out. So I let at least the top quarter of, of, of the soil to dry out before, before watering it again. That being the top said, quarter inch or the top quarter of the whole pot of the whole pot. Okay. Of the whole pot. And so, you know, I don't measure it out with a ruler or anything like that. I just stick my finger in there. And so, you know, the top two or three inches, I'll, I'll let dry out before I actually water it again. And then you're giving it like a very thorough water. And then a very thorough watering all, all on the surface. And, no, you know, normally I wait until a tiny bit comes out of, of the drainage holes and then I stop. Um, if, if too much of it collects, I'll, you know, especially for a giant pot, what I like to do is I take out my turkey baster. I don't know if you've done this before. And I suck out all the water. I have a dedicated turkey baster that I use. That's so funny. That's so clever. I've never done that before to pull the water out of the saucer. Yes. If it's too big to move. Yeah. That's very clever. Cause you're not supposed to leave it after, you know, you can leave it for like 12 hours or whatever to allow for capillary action. But then after you got to be sucking that out. Yes. Otherwise your soil will stay, you know, much too wet. And then, you know, that can cause issues. Down the line. Yeah. That's so clever. So these are drought, drought tolerant plants. We're letting them dry out pretty thoroughly and then giving them a good water again. But not completely. I would recommend not letting your soil dry out completely. Okay. Because, or for, especially for too long, it's okay if they dry out completely, just don't wait too long. Otherwise you can have leaves dropping. Um, you, you can have your lower leaves turning yellow and brown and falling off. That, that can be caused by, I know we'll get to that later on when we talk about issues with um, you know, problems with, 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 uh, related to the rubber plant. Don't wait too long after it's completely dried out. Yeah. I'm very sensitive about trying drought tolerance right now, because I went through a phase where I underwatered some plants thinking that I was letting them go through a drought and their roots shriveled up. And then the plant is, has been in terrible condition because I let that soil dry out so dramatically. So yes. there's, these are all learning opportunities. You know, you, oh, you sway, sway on the pendulum, but, um, Absolutely. yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting. So let's talk about light. Cause light is always such a, such a huge thing yes. for, for plant parents. Oh my gosh. Okay. So for a rubber plant at, um, just as a general rule of thumb, put it in front of a window. I don't care what window you have indoors okay. because indoors. So you, you've traveled, you were just in Costa Rica, right? And you said you saw rubber plants growing out in, in direct you know, sunlight, direct, in direct sunlight. Yeah. If you witness a plant growing in direct, in full sunlight outside, that means indoors, you cannot overdo it. Mm -hmm. Our light indoors is so much less intense than it is outside. Mm -hmm. And so you cannot overdo light for your rubber plant indoors. Just given it, it's just, it, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and I, I talk about that in my, in my book as well. I, in my chapter on light that there isn't nearly as much light indoors as we, as we think there is just by virtue of the, of the fact that we're inside, just by the light going through the window, it automatically gets reduced tremendously. And then the further you get from the window, it dramatically drops off. So pick a window, any window for your rubber plant, Preferably, you want a window that has some direct sun. So if you have, you know, an eastern facing window that gets morning sun, that's beautiful. If you have a western facing window, gets afternoon sun, that's great. If you live in the northern hemisphere, 
and you have a southern window, those t- uh, unobstructed southern window, those tend to get a ton of direct sun. Mm-hmm. That's great too. And a north window, you know, in, in the northern hemisphere doesn't get any direct sun. That's fine. But and you should have it right in front of it, not off to the side, not two feet below, right in front of it, because mm-hmm. that makes a huge difference. And, you know, I mentioned the hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, north and south is reversed, which I thought that was really interesting. Now, when it comes to water, I'm going to tie this into water because this is things things work together that Mm -hmm. way, right? When it comes to water, the more light you have, the quicker your soil is going to dry out because your plant's going to be growing more. Mm -hmm. So if you have plenty of sun, then you have to monitor, monitor your plant a lot more frequently because it's going to dry out, dry out more. Yeah. Or more quickly, I should say. It's a great point. I will also say, I think I'll make a radical statement right now, but I think in general, people overestimate how much light that they have indoors. Yes. yes. And I'm a great example of that. When I started caring for plants, when I started Bloom and Grow Radio, I was a total novice, really learning all of these concepts as I was interviewing people. I learned, oh, I have Southern facing windows. That's amazing. I have the best type of light. And I had unobstructed Southern southern facing windows. It was fantastic. My plants were very happy. But what I didn't realize was how drastically that light gets reduced foot after foot away from my window. Yes. And all of my windows were on one side of my apartment. So I was putting plants in almost no light, thinking that I was putting them in medium light or bright indirect light because there was Mm -hmm. enough light to visibly like have, have the room lit during the day, but the volume of light reaching those plants wasn't nearly enough for anyone listening who hasn't, I have a free download on my website called understanding natural light. And it's actually the process that I did to learn this lesson. (laughs) Um, and you basically, you track your light with a light meter for a few days and I kind of walk you through it, but yeah, I think in general, even if you've got those huge, you know, Southern facing windows that I had, once you get six inches from that big window, you're still in that medium, medium light area, you know, it drops off dramatically. I actually have, you'll, you'll like this since you, you brought up your, um, your light experiment in my light chapter in my book, I have a graph showing how quickly it, the light decays. Oh, that's amazing. And it's uh, remarkable when you look at that science. It really is. It really mm-hmm. is. And it's, it is eye opening. And I, I, I know you brought up the fact, the term low light, oftentimes rubber plants are labeled as low light plants, but they, they are not, they are not. Yeah. Just like the snake plant. Just like the snake plant. And I, I, you know, in fact, those are the two examples that I often use when describing, you know, low light plants and, but they're just going to, they're going to look sad over time. Mm -hmm. They're going to look sad over time. Rubber plants are not low light plants. Um, they, they can tolerate it. They can tolerate it if your other conditions are okay, but they will do much better for you. They will grow so much more quickly if you give them plenty of of light. And I don't think you can overdo light for these plants indoors. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And, you know, you could put them in your low light scenario, but it's not going to grow if you want that growth. Right. Yes. What about soil? So you talked about, you know, letting the soil get me- medium dry esque. Uh, what do you recommend for soil? I mean, any, any well draining soil will do. And there's a lot of different combinations and it all depends on, you know, the conditions that you have for my rubber plant that I have now, when I repotted it, I think it was probably five years ago at, at this point, I, I didn't measure everything specifically but it's mainly, I started off with an all-purpose potting mix. I probably used miracle Grow, um, And then I added some perlite and a little bit of orchid bark as well. And it drains beautifully. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't sit on top. As soon as you start, as soon as I start watering it, it, it gets absorbed right away. Um, in general, I, I would say starting off maybe three parts of, you know, your favorite all-purpose potting mix and then mixing in one part perlite. I think that's a great starting point. Mm-hmm. And you can add all the other stuff if you want. If you want to add orchid bark, that's fine too. Um, but just be careful that you can overdo adding all these different things. Yeah. So the, the chunkier you make your potting mix, the more frequently you're going to have to water. And I recently, um, someone emailed me through my through my blog, 
asking a question about his Monster Deliciosa. And he said, oh, this was so beautiful. And, you know, I, it had several leaves. It was beautiful when I got it. And I, it lost several leaves. They all turned yellow. And he said, I, I'm afraid I'm killing it. How can I help it? And I said, can you send me a picture? So he sent me a picture. And when I took a, took a look at it, it said everything that I, that I needed to know. It looked like his plant was planted in, his Monstera was planted in mostly orchid bark. Mm. And I said, how often are you watering? And I'm not a fan of strict watering schedules, which I can touch on that in a second too. Uh, but he said, oh, probably every, every 10 days to two weeks. And I said, given that, you know, it's mostly orchid bark, that your plant probably is completely desiccated and drying out. And you, you want a balance between moisture retention and drainage. Thank you to our episode sponsors, Territorial Seed Company and Espoma Organic. Plant friends, if you are looking for plants for your garden this spring, skip the lines at the garden center and let Territorial Seed Company deliver top of the line healthy and hardy vegetable plants right to your door. So you have heard me talk about Territorial Seed Company and their expansive seed catalog on this podcast before, but did you know that they also have an amazing line of pre-grown plants that are hand-grown at the territorial farm using their perfect plant custom soil mix, fed with fresh farm-made compost tea, and shipped in plant-safe mailing boxes. So whether you want seeds or plants, Territorial Seed Company has you covered. Last year, I filled out my garden with some of their pre-grown plants, including their snacking peppers and lavender, and the plants arrived in great condition. And you don't even have to worry because the plants all come with 100% guarantee. Territorial Seed Company has your garden needs covered when it comes to your plant selection whether it's seeds of any variety you could dream of or their pre-grown plants shipped right to your door or even using their amazing garden planner to plan your garden this season. So whatever you need, they've got you covered. Visit TerritorialSeed.com and use the exclusive coupon code for the Bloom and Grow community, GROW10. That's GROW10 at TerritorialSeed.com for 10% off your order. Oh, we know I love Espoma Organics, this 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Okay, plant friends, it's go time. It's time to get ready for the spring and summer gardens, and Espoma has you covered when it comes to potting soils, garden and lawn fertilizers, and organic controls for you and your home. They have potting and garden mixes tailored to your garden setup. However you're gardening, whether it's in-ground beds, raised beds, containers, and all of their mixes are enhanced with performance-boosting ingredients like mycotone, yucca extract, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, feather meal, earthworm castings, all those fancy things that you hear about, they're putting in their mixes, which will set you up for a successful gardening season. You also might know them because they're pretty famous for their organic fertilizer that you can match to whatever you're growing, the tone line. So they're famous for their holly tone. They basically have a tone for every plant you could be growing. And now they've got their biotone starter plus, which you could use when you actually plant up your garden at the top of your gardening season. And to top it all off, Espoma has a huge sustainability commitment with 100% solar powered plant, zero waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link below to go to my Bloom and Grow Amazon storefront to show you my favorite picks. Okay, back to the show. That's interesting you bring that up. First off, shout out to Espoma Organic. They're they're one of my sponsors and I love using their potting mix and then mixing some of their orchid bark. That's like been my new little thing that I do. But I will say, oftentimes I recently I got a, my first anthurium crystallinum. So I ended up putting some more orchid bark than I normally would because I thought I am going to overwater this thing because I'm going to be helicopter plant parenting. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like if you're going to overlove something, if you're someone who wants to water super frequently, that's yes. kind of a hack you could do to kind of encourage that, but also realize, you know, the organic matter in the potting mix is important. So you can't just be putting it in, you know, perlite. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I feel you like want... that making your own soil mix is so popular now, but it's too, there is a too chunky for sure. Yes, absolutely. Unless you said, unless you like to water every two or three days, which right. if you do go ahead and do it, but I, I don't, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to water too frequently. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. So we hit water light soil. 
What about fertilizer for these puppies? Cause I know people want them to grow super big. Yeah. So as far as fertilizer goes, any, you know, pick your favorite fertilizer that you like to use. Any balanced fertilizer would be perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's different NPK, you know, formulations for, for fertilizer, but you can really use any all purpose houseplant fertilizer. That's yeah. fine. Okay. What I, what I like to do, uh, you know, there's a couple different options. If you don't like to fertilize frequently, or if you, or if you don't like to use liquid fertilizers, you can always use something like a time release fertilizer that you can add, add to your pot. And, you know, some of them are good for six months or, you know, most of the growing season. And, you know, that way you, you add it once and then you're done for a few months. What I like to do is I use a liquid fertilizer and I like to water dilutely with every, with every watering. And, you know, that, that's supposed to, you know, everybody has their own thing. It's supposed to mimic what, what plants do in nature, right? They, they get nutrients slowly released um, to them in, in the soil from decaying leaves, things like oh, that. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. They're not getting a huge shot of fertilizer. You know, it, it's, it's slower. So you're giving them a little bit at a time every time you water. So I, I use that method. So for my, my fertilizing, I'll add a quarter teaspoon to a half a teaspoon per gallon every time I, I water. And, and it could be different depending on what fertilizer you're using, but the label should tell you that if you want to water with every watering, do it that way. If it says, you know, uh, fertilize once a month, with a tablespoon, then I would maybe do a quarter of that mm -hmm. per gallon every time you water. Okay. For example. Got it. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. So that's general care. I feel like the big headline is put it in light. And then the subheader is <laughs> put it, uh, don't overwater it <laughs> yep. forever plant. So it seems like this could be a very easy to care for plant, but you've seems said that, that you get lots and lots <laughs> of questions about rubber plants. So I love, um, I love working our way through your common rubber plant questions and having this be a living resource for people. So let's start with, I'm just going to, uh, I will ask you, go through this list with you. So the first question, why is my rubber plant not growing? Light. Yeah. Plain and simple light. So I, I've had a lot of readers comment on my on my blog, send me messages on Instagram. My plant's not growing. And literally, after several months, they're still not growing. And then when I ask them, you know, where do you have your plant? How far is it from a window? What exposure is it? Oftentimes, you know, it's on the other end of the uh, of, of the room from where the window is. Move your plant light bar none. The top the top reason why. Mm. So, and, and like I said, you can't overdo, you really can't overdo light. It would be so difficult to overdo the light indoors for this plant as, as well. You mentioned fertilizer. So if your plant's not growing and you have it in a dark corner, don't think that fertilizer is going to help. It might actually be doing more harm than good. So for, think of fertilizer as an additional thing that you, you should be doing with your houseplant care routine after everything else is taken care of, after your plant's in good light you're watering properly, your plant's growing, and then you can supplement with your fertilizer to, to make it grow even bigger and faster. But it right. should not be used as a fix because your plant's not growing. Light is the number one reason why your plant's not growing. So if it's in light, but you haven't changed the soil or fertilized ever, that's when it's time to try with the fertilizer. Because there's yes. so many, there's such yeah. a hurdle, I think, I remember going through this, not fertilizing your plants. And then because fertilizer can be so intimidating, you know, I've talked to people who've never fertilized their plants and they've had plants for five years. And at that point, it's like, okay, well, maybe you want to just put a little fertilizer in there yeah. <laughs> just to yes. replenish that soil. Yes. Okay. Question number two, how do I get my plant to branch and become bushier instead of tall? That is a very, very, very common question. So there, there is actually more than one way to accomplish that. One, and this scares so many people, but you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be scared. If you've been living with your plant for a while and it looks good, don't be afraid to do this, is to prune it. Just hack it off. Hack it off wherever you want. You know, don't hack it all the way down to the, to the soil, to the pot, but, you know, chop off a, a good portion of it. And that will force some new branches to, to start forming. So that's one, that's one option. There's another option, actually, that's, I guess you can call it a little bit more advanced. Um, it's 
you can propagate and then chop it off and then create a bushier, a bushier plant. So if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever tried air layering a plant. So mm -hmm. it is a great, it's a great method for very woody plants like rubber plants tend to get so that you're not stressing out the cutting. If you just prune off a big branch on your rubber plant and it's, it has a big woody stem on it, that cutting is going to be stressed. So if, if you use a process like air layering, what you're doing is you're allowing roots to form while it's still on the plant. And then once it's rooted, then you can cut it off. So that's another option too. Can you give a quick breakdown of what air layering is? You don't need to do a tutorial, but just for yeah. people who've never heard of it before. Absolutely. What you're basically going to do is take a sharp knife and you're going to make a cut on a diagonal into your rubber plant trunk. And you're going to go about halfway. So right about, right, you know, right about halfway through. And then at that point, then you're going to take moist sphagnum moss and you're basically going to shove it in where, where you cut it just to prop it open a little bit. Um, and then you're going to wrap the, that entire area around the stem, around the, the branch. And then you can take, you know, saran wrap or plastic wrap and wrap it around it and then tie it on both ends. And so over, over the course of a few months, then it's going to actually send out roots from where you cut it. And then you, the, the reason you want to use a clear plastic wrap is that you can actually see the roots once they start growing. And then at that point, then you can just cut it off right under, right under, you know, where you conducted the air layering, and then you can pot it up. And then after that, then you've, you know, essentially pruned that part off. And then your original plant, then that'll spur the extra side branches to, to form as well. So you can kind of conquer, do two things at once. You can branch off your original plant and then also propagate it at the same time. I love that. Yeah. Cause pruning off that top, hacking off that top is going to instigate more growth and then you can root it. That's how I turned many four inch plants into eight or 10 inch plants um, <laughs> by rooting and re repopping. So that brings us to another one of your follower questions is propagation. What are the best ways to propagate a rubber plant? So do you recommend air layering as your number one? Yeah. So that's definitely, there are more. So that's number one. And like I said, that works best if if you have a really woody plant, if the branches are very woody and, and you wanna propagate, so that, that will work the best, although the con is that it's much slower. So it will take a few months. Um, and I, I do have to say, propagation will also work the best during the active growing season. So if you're doing it in the middle of winter, that may not be the best time to do it. It's not to say that you can't propagate year round, you absolutely can, but you might have less of a success rate and it'll be substantially slower if you're not doing it in the spring or summertime when the plant is actually um, actively growing. Mm -hmm. So besides air layering, another, another way that you can propagate your rubber plant is you could make individual node cuttings. And so you can you know, prune off a, a section of your plant and then wherever the leaf meets your, your branch, just trim it off on either end. You know, leave maybe, you know, I don't know, half an inch on either side. So you're basically left with a leaf and then part of the stem, which is where, where, you know, where, where the node is. And then at that point, you can either, I don't know if you're a water propagator or a soil propagator, you can do either one. And you stick it in soil until it starts to grow roots. Um, or you could just put it directly into potting mix and it'll, it'll grow a new plant. I have one cup of water next to my weird mad botanist table that I have next to my desk. And right now it has a philodendron pink princess tip cutting, a nice. monstera peru, and like three raffidora tetrasperma cuttings. I just like have an, <laughs> have an ongoing cup of water and like throw cuttings in all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, okay. Next question. Why are my new leaves on my plants smaller than the older ones? That's a... Uh... Also, a very common question that I get, and you know, it's happened. It's happened on mine too. And actually, there's at the tip of what of my really big rubber plant, there's a leaf that's probably an inch long. Well, what what happened there? So I would say, if you just brought your plant home, let's say from from a nursery, and you've experienced that, I think th th there's a number of reasons why why that can happen. 
number one, you know, our conditions at home are, are nothing like ideal conditions from the greenhouses that these plants were grown in. That in and of itself could be, could be a cause. Poor lighting is, is another cause as well. Also your soil moisture. So just poor conditions overall. If you're letting your, your plant dry out too much as it's developing new leaves, that can also affect the size of the leaves as well. So inconsistent conditions while new leaves are growing can, can be an issue for your plant, whether it's dealing with light, with your potting mix, moisture, or both. Okay. Awesome. What about dropping leaves? Those beautiful, precious, large leaves. It's so sad when they drop to the ground. It is. And, and that's a huge one. That also can be caused by several different factors. It often happens when you first bring your rubber plant home. And with, as, as with a lot of ficus species, they don't like to be moved first and foremost. Mm -hmm. That's one reason they can drop. Another reason they can drop off is if you bring your plant home and you shove it in a dark corner, you will get leaves dropping off. It, it's just going to happen. And that's a very common, that's a very common issue because your plant is not going to be able to support all the leaves that it, it had when it was growing in good conditions. And so the plant's basically shedding some leaves um, at, at that point to compensate for the lower light. You can also get leaf drop too from, from your soil drying out too much for too long as well. Or if you have a combination of all of the above. <laughs> and uh, one thing also that also comes to mind is, I don't know why, why this is the case, but uh, and maybe you've seen this when you're buying plants in, in a nursery. A lot of times I've noticed rubber plants that, you know, in, in larger containers, you know, maybe gallon size containers, and they're horribly root bound. Mm -hmm. They're horribly root bound. You touch the top, uh, you touch the surface, and it's all roots. Mm -hmm. And so in that case too, if your plant is horribly root bound, you're not going to be able to keep the roots hydrated enough. You're not going to, it's going to be very hard to keep up with the watering. And mm -hmm. so that coupled with if you have a fear of overwatering or I, I call it overwatering and that's actually that's actually a trigger word for me um, <laughs> I, I have I haven't told you this yet it's a trigger word and I, I have a section in my book dedicated to the word overwatering because it leads to so many misconceptions and it leads to a fear of watering properly mm -hmm. so if if your plant is horribly root bound it's going to be really difficult to keep it hydrated and so you really need to put it in a bigger pot at that point, because otherwise you're going to be kind of going around in circles trying to trying to keep it watered enough. And so that that can also lead to to leaf drop as well um, due, due to the soil moisture issue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's so funny. It's a trigger word for you. I I get that though because people really have so much fear around watering and am I doing it right? And is this wrong? Or I think plant parents can be so hard on themselves. Absolutely. If your plant's doing good, you're probably fine. And even if you kill a plant, that's okay. It's okay. It's all a learning Live opportunity. And learn. Live, Live and learn. Live and learn. Yeah, totally. And with, with overwatering, if I can just interject one more thing, mm -hmm. the reason it causes issues is because people get so scared to water properly that oftentimes they go too far in the other direction. And, you know, they might even measure out, you know, for their succulent, a tablespoon of water, but then you're going to end up dehydrating your roots. Yeah. So you're not thoroughly watering all your roots are not. Well, what I like to say is, do you care about all of your roots or just some of them? Yeah. Right? <laughs> all great. of your roots, all of your roots need enough water, but it's, you need to also consider other factors as well. If your soil's not drying out, enough, then you, you have to look at some of your other factors. And that I talk about that a lot in my book. Yeah, no, totally. Agreed. Agreed. What about my plant looks healthy, but the branches are all over the place. Why is this happening? I actually tied up my rubber plant the other day because it was, it was kind of going, going all over the place as well. What we have to remember indoors. So indoors, we don't have the benefit of wind right? Mm -hmm. And so that actually, wind will actually strengthen plants outside. And so we, we don't have air circulation indoors. We don't have wind. And so it's not going to reinforce our plants. 
Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It's okay to tie up your plant. So I, I have a bamboo stake that I shoved literally right through, right through the root ball. And I gently tied the branches that were creeping over. And actually one time I remember, I think it was um, last year, you know, we had a couple of friends over for, for, for dinner. And I, I hadn't realized how far over my rubber plant had crept over the couch. And one of my friends was kind of, you know, going like, like this, leaning over. I don't know that I can't. This rubber plant's attacking me here, um, and so there's nothing wrong with staking up your plants. Mm -hmm. Preach! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what about tiny white spots on my plants' leaves? So that's that's an interesting one. There's nothing wrong if you notice those those little tiny spots. They're tiny little white spots, and often you'll see them around the perimeter of your leaf. You know, after getting this question, I, I researched it and investigated it. And apparently, the little tiny white dots are called lithocysts, and they're cells that contain calcium carbonate. They're nothing to be worried about. They don't do any harm for, for your plants. I don't know what their purpose is, but mm -hmm. it won't do any harm for, for your plants if you see those. So, interesting. Yeah, no that worries. makes me think of too, like depending on what you're watering your plants with, sometimes those minerals will show up in the plant leaves and you can just wipe them off. Yeah. And maybe, maybe, you know, with the fertilizer that you're using or maybe calcium mm -hmm. from tap water. I use tap water for almost all my plants. Totally. Okay. What about if I have a variegated rubber plant that has browning edges? Yeah. So, so that's another common, common issue. And I would say in those cases, it's probably due to your soil moisture being off. So either your soil went too dry or your plant stayed too wet. Some people will say, oh, it's due to, it's due to lighting. Maybe, you know, my plants in too, it's maybe getting too much light. But in my experience, I don't, I don't see that. And unless, unless I, I will bring in this, this caveat. Um, and I forgot to mention this when you asked about light. Whenever you're increasing light for any plant, even if it's a sun-loving plant, if you're moving a plant to a much higher position of light, whether it's a super sunny window or especially if you're moving a plant from inside to outside, you have to slowly acclimate your plant. Otherwise, your plant will burn within a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. And so that goes even for sun loving plants, your plant has to acclimate to higher light. So that, that even goes, if you buy a plant from, you know, in the mail and it's spent time in a dark box, you can't just shove it into full sun right away. It's going to burn. Same thing goes moving a plant from indoors to outdoors. You have to do it really slowly and to put it in full shade at first and gradually increase the light. So in that case, then yes, that, that could be causing the browning, but typically for variegated plants, they are not as forgiving as their non-variegated counterparts. So try to avoid your potting mix from going completely dry or on the other end, you know, don't let it sit in water for too long because they're more sensitive to those factors. Yeah. I also feel like this is a great time for us to just kind of insert a disclaimer as well of so many of these troubleshooting things can mean so many different things for people because yes. you talk about brown edges just like you said, it could be a water thing. It could be a humidity thing. Maybe your plant's yes. next to the radiator and it's getting super dry heat. It could be um, fungal. It could be, it could be so many things. So this is what you're generally seeing. It's not a once, you know, a catch off for everything, but these are generalized answers to 90% of plant situations. This will be the answer to, but know that you might be, you know, the 10% that, that it varies. So it's all about experimentation and figuring it out. Then one other question from a garden society member, my rubber tree has long aerial roots. I think this means it's happy, but do they grow better in slightly cooler conditions? It hasn't been unusual for my plant room to be 65 to 70 on cooler days and up to 80 in the summer. So aerial roots, this is a cool thing and you don't really see them that often. I feel like indoors and it, it could be maybe from, from an age perspective as well. But if you see these plants growing out in nature, in warm climates that are growing in the ground and you have these huge plants, they actually send out these aerial roots and, you know, from, from the plant itself. And then they, they kind of drape down until they touch the soil. 
and then they grow and then they start to grow into the soil. So that, that is a perfectly natural thing that these plants do. And as far as temperature goes, that's a perfectly acceptable temperature range. I mean, I, I always like to say for most of the plants that we grow indoors as house plants, if you're comfortable, your plant's going to be comfortable as well. So 65 to 80, that's perfectly, perfectly wonderful temperatures for, for, for your rubber plant. Okay, cool. So I loved this troubleshooting. If someone was like me who is getting their first rubber plant or maybe has a rubber plant or two and looking to kind of expand their collection, what are your favorite varieties? What would you suggest? Sure. So I would say if you've never grown a rubber plant before, I would say stick with a non, start with, I should say, a non-variegated rubber plant, just because they're 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 going to be a little bit easier and not as mm-hmm. finicky as, as a variegated one. So um, Robusta would be would be a great a great one to start with. And if you love variegated plants, either depending on the color, I guess it's just a preference. You can either go with the Tinnicky or the Ruby cultivar. Those are those are both beautiful beautiful cultivars. Yeah. And I, I would say don't, don't overlook that burgundy one too, man. That's a beautiful plant. That's a beautiful one too. It's all personal, personal preference, but I would say if you've never grown one, do a non-variegated one until you're comfortable with it. And then go ahead and get a a variegated one. Once you're, once you're plain green one is thriving and you're comfortable with the care. Totally. Or if you want to nerd out and learn a thing or two about variegation, you could buy a green one and a variegated both. one, put them next to each other and observe how differently they grow. That's kind of a fun idea too. That's a great one too. <laughs> I love it. Well, this has been so fun. I'm so excited for you to be publishing your book. I love that I got to be a part of you receiving your book for the first time. The cover looks beautiful. So where did you come up with the name of Houseplant Warrior? I I don't know where it came from. It just kind of popped in my head with you know, so many people struggling to try to figure houseplants out. And so the term just popped in my head as, as a way to, okay, I'm finally going to, I'm going to get this. I'm going to be a warrior. I'm going to understand what plants like, what they don't like, and I'm finally going to get this. Um, so mm-hmm. it, it really all stemmed from all the feedback and questions that, that I've been getting from my readers for my blog and also, you know, the numerous questions on, on Instagram, it kind of triggered that, that title, probably. <laughs> I love that. So it's called Houseplant Warrior. What's the subtitle? Seven Keys to Unlocking the Mysteries of Houseplant Care. Awesome. Who is the book geared for? Is it for an ultimate beginner? Is it for someone who's had plants for a while looking to expand? So all of, all of the above, I would say what particularly be useful to the beginner mm-hmm. or anyone that has been growing even houseplants for for a while but they're struggling with them in any way or you know maybe they're they're reading conflicting advice and they really don't know what to do or what's what works what doesn't the main focus in my book besides talking about you know all the main topics of light watering fertilizing, repotting, soil mixes, all of that stuff is I I try to teach my readers how to observe. For example, what happens, you know, when we Google something, why does my why does my rubber plant have a yellow leaf? The first thing normally that pops up on most on I shouldn't say most sites, on a lot of sites are going to tell you you're overwatering. But then people don't even observe, they don't actually feel their soil to see if they quote, overwatered. So it's, and oftentimes when I ask someone to feel their soil, they say, well, I overwater my plant, it's suffering. Once they touch their soil, it's bone dry. They did not overwater. In fact, they did the opposite. They underwatered, so I yeah. I teach people to ask the right questions and to observe their plants. And then at that point, it's a process. I'm, t- I'm trying to teach people to become their own plant doctor. I love it. What's your favorite of the seven principles? Oh my gosh, probably the troubleshooting, the troubleshooting chapter. And what I did there was I took all the common questions that I get over and over and over and over again. And I I go through kind of like a, a, almost like an interview format, asking the question and then the response back from the plant parent. And so I have case studies that I, that I created that were all based off of real, real world questions and resolutions that my readers have. Oh, that's really cool. That's super clever. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Well, where can people get the book and where can people find you in case they want to follow you or read your blog? Yeah. So people can find me on, uh, from my, my blog, ohiotropics.com. And I have a book section in the menu. So if you just hover over that, you can see Houseplant Warrior pop up. Um, I also have a button just on the main page for Houseplant Warrior. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at Ohio Tropics. I do have a Facebook page as well. I do have a YouTube channel, which I'm trying to do more of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Haven't it's gotten hard quite to do there. it all. Yeah, it is. It really is. <laughs> and then one one last thing, real quick, for my book, I also teach a a holistic approach to houseplant care. So you cannot just be focused on watering and ignore light and the size of your pot and your potting mix, it all works together. So understanding your conditions and all those aspects of houseplant care, they all work together. You cannot just focus on watering or just light. They all work together and they all affect each other. I love that. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on a copy. Thank you for stopping by and talking rubber plants. I'm so happy we finally got to give the humble rubber plant an episode of its own the links to Raphael's book and obviously all of his socials will be in the show notes. So thanks so much, Raphael. I'm uh, very excited for you. Thank you so much, Maria. So nice chatting with you finally. Yes, you too. Thank you, Raphael. Congratulations. Links to his book for Houseplant Warrior are in the show notes. Make sure to snag it. It was so fun. Before we did our official interview, Raphael, I think as you heard in this interview, you know, he just got his shipment or you might have seen it on my Instagram. He had just gotten his shipment of books and it was very fun to share share that moment with him of, of opening his box and seeing his book for the first time. Got me very excited for my book that's coming out soon. You're going to hear more about that on next week's episode. I'm very excited for him. I've since received the book. It's it's beautiful. Um, so check it out. Also, if Raphael has you curious about his socials, you can go check out the links to all of his socials for Ohio Tropics in the show notes. Okay, plant friends, spring is coming for our plants and for ourselves. What does it feel like to have a spring awakening within yourself, right? How are you feeling the sun warming your soul these days? I'm going to leave you with that beautiful plant-inspired thought until I see you next time for a very exciting episode. I am so excited for the episode that will be next in the feed. Make sure you don't miss it. There will be tons of exciting information in it. So until next time, my sweet plant friends. Keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile, and with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent, and most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow radio guest, Leslie Halleck. 
all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like The Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. 
So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. <music> 